Uh oh, I just heard something go. So what you're going to need is, of course, some clean jars. I'm going to use quarts because I want to uh, can more than a couple of servings per uh, jar. I've got eight pounds, eight pounds of ground beef, two onions. These are fairly large uh, considering, um, and they've been chilled in the freezer for about 30 minutes. And that's just so when I cut the, the root part off or whatever and a few of the little gases escape, <laughs> the gases escape. I'm not going to be crying after I cut it. The other things you're gonna need, if you add salt to meatloaf, make sure you use the kind that does not have iodine. Sometimes it'll be called unidized salt. Sometimes it'll just tell you in the corner or whatever that this doesn't meet your iodine level or whatever. Black pepper to taste, garlic powder, and a little onion powder because I want this to be a little bit more tangy since it's going to have barbecue and brown sugar in it. I'm also going to add some beef bouillon. I'm also going to add some beef bouillon. In this case, it's going to be bouillon flavor. I don't worry too much about the little tangy aftertaste that goes with, you know, some bouillon flavors. And that's because um, it's going to kind of be melded all in with the other flavors in this meatloaf. Now, if you're using it, you know, in another dish or whatever where it doesn't have a whole lot of other flavors that compete with it, then basically you're going to be like, hmm, I could taste the iodine in that. And you really can. You can taste the iodine in the, the salt. That's why you use an iodized salt because pressure canning is going to bring out that iodine aftertaste. I'm going to use Sweet Baby Ray's Hickory and Brown Sugar Barbecue Sauce and I'm going to use some ketchup. Now. None of this is going to be measuring spoons and measuring cup. Now, where people differ in meatloaf is usually, I use breadcrumbs or I use oatmeal. So you can use either one. You can use quick cooked oats, uh, quick cooked rolled oats to be exact. You can use quick cooked oats if you chop them up a little bit, you know, put them in the food processor or, you know, old school knifey, knifey, knifey or you can use the uh, breadcrumb. In this case, I'm gonna use Italian style breadcrumbs. I did not use stale bread that I've chopped up into cubes and then placed into the, the processor, although you can certainly do this whole thing from scratch. I just don't have time for that. So, salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, chopped onions. I'm using yellow onions, by the way, because white onions will have a little bit of an extra bite that I really don't want in this meatloaf. If I was gonna be doing pizza meatloaf, in which case I would use a uh, pizza sauce or, you know, a marinara that's kind of spicy. Yeah, I, you can do just about any meatloaf recipe, I think, known to man, and can it. And if I forget something, I'm sure you'll tell me. But I'm also gonna use one egg, basically per one and one quarter pounds is the general rule of thumb, but I'm gonna go ahead and use one egg per pound. Use one egg per one and a quarter pounds. I think that's the general rule of thumb, but I'm gonna go ahead and use seven eggs even though I've got eight pounds, and that's because I had seven eggs that were in one carton. I'm just gonna use the carton. Trust me, I mean, you really can't screw this up. Well, you can. Don't forget the brown sugar. That white stuff. That's the stuff that makes you cry.
That's all the stuff that makes you cry right there. See it coming out? Well, you don't have to do all the wiping if you don't want to, but it's so concentrated coming out that root ball right now. Now's the chance to go ahead and cut the rest of this onion up. All right, I got all my ground turkey in this bowl now. It doesn't look like it's gonna be enough room, does it? It will though. And I haven't put anything else in it except for the ground turkey. I went ahead and cleaned up uh, the, the table and the other bowl that I had all my drippings and disgustingness in from the wrapper. And I cleaned up the ceiling. Yeah, uh, I can't believe that I actually dropped <laughs> I dropped um, some goopiness. Well, okay, I didn't drop it. I used a knife and I slit the side of the wrapper and it spurted onto the ceiling. So, yeah, I had to clean that up. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm shaking off about um, a quarter of a cup of beef bouillon and that's because I like that the beef flavor and even if I had ground beef I'd be doing it and if you get a little bit more in that's okay now this would be pressed down bouillon so if you're actually measuring it off make sure you press it down and get the air out of it so you can get the whole quarter of a cup in there with the breadcrumbs or rolled oats I'm just gonna go about a cup full and maybe a, a cup and a half. I think I'll do a cup and a half. And I can eyeball it. I've done this recipe so many times and I've canned it so many times. And if you want to do a little bit more, you can because the rule of thumb is actually about that much per pound if you want to really stretch it. But um, the more you put in there, the more I don't want to say limber it gets, but when you get out your um, your can and you want to, or your can, when you pull out your jar and you want to eat some meatloaf, you, you know, depending on the texture is basically what, what you're going for. And I want it to still kind of be a loaf and not so much a crumble. If you're doing... Um, like cooked ground turkey, which of course it wouldn't be meatloaf at that point, but if you're doing it cooked, and this goes for beef or chicken or whatever else that, that, that you grind and you know put in there, it's going to be crumbly once you get it out of the pressure canner because it's already cooked. Um, I like to do it raw so it's a little bit more like the texture you know, of when it is cooked. So it's only cooked once. It's cooked twice if you cook it beforehand, and I've done that too. So, anyway. Onion powder. This is gonna be um, about three tablespoons. Same with the garlic powder. If you use minced garlic, that's wonderful. Minced garlic works just as well. Now, I like a lot of black pepper, but because this is more on the sweet end, I'm not gonna put as much in there, so I'm only gonna put about a tablespoon. And remember the salt. The salt, again, it's to your taste and I'm only gonna use about a tablespoon. So I basically put a cup of ketchup and then a cup of barbecue sauce. 
Now I have not put my brown sugar in yet and I'm gonna keep my barbecue sauce out because I'm gonna use it um, to top off each jar. Just a little bit, you know, I'm gonna put a little bit on the bottom and a little bit on top. And that's because, you know, then it'll be a little bit more like a meatloaf. Plus it'll look a little more appealing. Now granted, the barbecue sauce is gonna run down the sides and all that and that'll be fine. <laughs> The rule of thumb with brown sugar is a half a cup of brown sugar per pound of meat. But again, all of this is to taste and it's gonna come off quite sweet. So it'll literally be sweet and tangy, which is what I'm going for. You guys hop all that with me? It's actually not, I didn't use um, a whole half a pound, or a whole half a pound, a whole half a cup of brown sugar per pound. I did not, I'm, I'm actually going on the more conservative end because only my kids like that much brown sugar in their meatloaf. And now for the eggs. Now at this point you could go ahead and start just kind of mixing it up or letting somebody else put their hands in it and start mixing it and dump the eggs on top, but I'm just going to do it all at once. Mr. Owl, how many eggs does it take? <laughs> now if you compost, egg is really good for that. But if you have a dog that goes through your compost or digs up your stuff, egg may not be as good as we thought. It's going to attract, you know, dogs, raccoons, possums, rats, roaches, <laughs> whatever's trying to escape for the winter anyway. If you'd like to have a little pleasing crunch, feel free to add that eggshell. Don't let anything go to waste. Who's ready to get messy? So we're just gonna mix all this stuff together. This is where your love for goopy stuff comes in. Now, didn't I tell you it would all fit in the bowl? It all fits, but make sure that you mix it very well. If you're gonna, you know, put a little blender thingy in that that's fine if you're going to use a spoon that's fine too but most people use their hands for meatloaf and I'll use my hands as long as they're covered now for this next part you're going to want some vinegar and a paper towel and your jars and maybe a spatula, the little thing that comes inside your jar kit, your jar kit, your canning kit, or you can buy them separately. But they're basically just flat, and that's just in case you get a little bit of air. I'll do the first one for you, but then you're on your own. Some people would use a funnel, but I'm not some people. So grab a handful, start stuffing. Literally, you know, I use the wide mouth jars specifically for this. Now, don't be shy. You're going to have to push it down because there's going to be a little bit of floofy air. So you want to get as much as possible in your jars. And that's why your vinegar and a towel is going to come in handy later. So anyway, some people would put the barbecue sauce on the bottom and the top. All right, now, here's what I'm gonna do before I add the barbecue. And there's still some, some air pockets in there. I can see them, whoop. See how it goes off the side? I'm gonna use my vinegar to wipe all that out. But yeah, that's why it's important to have a tool like this because there's gonna be air pockets and if you use your hand to stuff, it's just gonna come over the top, so you really need to use something. And if you don't have one of these, 
and you have a long handle spoon, use that. All right. And after I get it to my rim right here, the fill line, I'm just going to make a little circle hole, make a little cave there. And then that's where I'm gonna add my barbecue sauce. Couple spoonfuls. Because you will get stuff on there this way. Even using a funnel, um, you'll probably get a little bit on your rim and then your jars won't seal very well. So make sure you use that vinegar and wipe the meat fat, whatever, wipe your rims a few times. And then put the lid on, or yeah, put the lid on, put the rim on, finger tight, and you can do this with one hand, I just did, and I'm going to set it aside until I get all of them. Alright, that's everything, and I'm adding in my little jar of lard. Now you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six quart jars of this meatloaf that I made. And then there's my little pint of lard. Now when you get your canner full, at least for this um, All American 921 canner, um, you're not supposed to fill it up more than halfway full. Now this is actually you know not start it so it's cold everything in here was cold that's what a cold pack is when you start off with cold ingredients then everything else is cold also now because I have an all-american I had to also oil put a little bit of olive oil around here to keep everything from you know making it difficult to pull out pull the um, the lid off so what I'm gonna do now is turn it on and I'm only going to heat it up to about three. So they're going to warm up slowly. And that's what you have to do with a cold pack. It's not going to take long for them to, to reach a decent temperature. And that's just so I don't shock my jars into cracking. I'm going to put on my lid. If you have a weighted gauge, it's going to be under um, a thousand feet in altitude 75 minutes for pint jars if that's what you used or in my case because I use quart jars it's going to be 90 minutes at 10 if you have a dial gauge you're going to actually just go to 11 I have a weighted gauge so I'm going to go to 10 and that's where I'm going to try to get up to. Uh, basically, when I get about three or four pounds of pressure, um, and this thing is steaming really well, that's whenever I'm going to go ahead and put my weighted gauge on, and you'll get to see that process also. All right, so it's been in here now for about 15 minutes, and it's nice and warm. I can feel the heat from the canner. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it up too high and let's get this thing to venting. There, you see that steam there? It's unbroken venting. And I'm at about three pounds, two, three pounds of pressure right now. So yeah, it's about time to put the weighted gauge on. And if you put this on and it's on, say, the 15 instead of the 10 or the 5 instead of the 10, and that's if you're below 1,000, if you're above 1,000, you're going to do 15, then you have to turn it off, wait, and then start all over, basically. So, putting it on. Now, if I had made a mistake, I can't just take it right back off. I have to start the process all over again. So when I get to 10 pounds of pressure, that's when I'm going to start my timer for 90 minutes. Uh, 
Not yet. Not yet. Right now. Here we go. Alright, so I blinked basically. Um, I kind of was ignoring this just for about, I don't know, a minute as I was commenting on a YouTube video. <laughs> and I got up um, because I heard constant steam going out. And I really should be turning it down now, so I am. I'm going to turn it down to five, even though I think six is where it ought to go. And then we'll make sure this thing goes back down to ten. Now, um, this is why a lot of people are afraid of pressure canning, because you get higher than what you want pressure, and they're afraid it's going to explode. Now, I know for a fact that the All-American 921 and most of the, I think all the All-Americans have the three safety features, which is, of course, your dial, and then your weighted gauge helps you, you know, kind of keep track more accurately, but more specifically, there's a little black soft, uh, I don't know if you can see that, that thing, that little round black thing back there, it'll basically pop off before this thing would explode, you know, so it won't explode, because that'll pop off and release all your pressure, but then you have the added bonus of these screw-on latches here, and now I'm going back down, I'm going to move my um, heat back to six, which is more, um, I think, what it should be on, and we'll see if... Uh, it goes up. Now, if it goes to 9 or to 11, I'm, I'm not going to freak out and restart it, but I don't want it, like, going down to 8, you know. Alright, you hear that? There's occasional... Follow by ching, 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 clink, 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 yeah, any of that stuff... As long as it's occasional and not, like, the whole time like it was before where I was basically hemorrhaging steam, then it's fine for me. Alright, so I blinked, basically. Um, I kind of was ignoring this just for about, I don't know, a minute as I was commenting on a YouTube video. <laughs> and I got up, um because I heard constant steam going out, and I really should be turning it down now, so I am. I'm going to turn it down to five, even though I think six is where it ought to go. And then we'll make sure this thing goes back down to ten. Now, um, this is why a lot of people are afraid of pressure canning, because you get higher than what you want pressure, and they're afraid it's going to explode. Now, I know for a fact that the All-American 921 and most of the, I think all the All-Americans have the three safety features, which is, of course, your dial, and then your weighted gauge helps you, you know, kind of keep track more accurately, but more specifically, there's a little black soft, uh, I don't know if you can see that. That thing, that little round black thing back there. It'll basically pop off before this thing would explode. You know, so it won't explode because that'll pop off and release all your pressure. But then you have the added bonus of these screw-on latches here. And now I'm going back down. I'm going to move my um, heat back to six, which is more... Um, I think what it should be on, and we'll see if uh, it goes up. Now, if it goes to 9 or to 11, I, I'm not going to freak out and restart it, but I don't want it, like, going down to 8, you know. There's occasional... 
followed by tink, 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 clink, 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 yeah, any of that stuff, as long as it's occasional and not, like, the whole time like it was before where I was basically hemorrhaging steam, then it's fine for me. Uh-oh, I just heard something go... Kind of like beatboxing. Okay, I can't beatbox either. I'm not going to take the weighted gauge off because it's not at zero. We are going to wait until this thing gets right there to zero. Now, because this is steel, then it's going to be hot. So I'm just going to, you know, you can, you know, use a pot holder or something like that. But I'm just going to use a paper towel, fold it over and over. The rule of thumb is two minutes of letting that go. Um, another way you can tell is basically you have no sound coming out, no steam coming out. This is steam. You hear that? That's steam coming out. And when you don't hear it anymore, then you also know there's there's you know no more pressure built up. There's still going to be steam in there. So when you lift this and you open these up, which you ought to do it fairly quickly after you get to zero pressure and you let the weighted gauge off and let your two minutes go, you need to go ahead and, and open it up because it'll just get harder and harder at zero pressure to get this open. So, and you can hear it kind of dying down. All right, there's no more sound. But there's still gonna be steam. So after I open this, I'm going to kind of lift the uh, the lid this way so that it kind of pushes that steam that way instead of in my face. Actually, I had some meatloaf come out <laughs> of one of the jars. It, it came out of that one right there. I just put the lid on it since I don't know when that lid popped off or fell, well, it fell off. Um, and I might not have screwed it on good because I was talking. <laughs> so I'm going to take that one uh, after it cools down. I'm going to take that one and I'm going to put it in the house and bake it. So that's what it looks like. And that's what it did to the other jars. Now the moment you're waiting for, let's see what the canner looks like. It looks like a Mexican food accident in there. Definitely. Can't call it an yeah, look at that lid. It went. I'm trying to scrub off old cooking oil. Don't think I don't appreciate it. That looks like straight up toilet water. Is that what it looks like when you dump your RV line? I don't have an RV, so I don't know. <laughs> chunks. <laughs> There's chunks. 
Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, there's chunks all over it. There's some of your meatloaf. Ugh.